Yeah, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we're very excited to talk to you about Network ATC and, and the roadmap that's coming along with us. We've gotten some great feedback while Network ATC has been in preview. Um, if you're not familiar with it, this is uh, you know a, a, a brand new service that's coming to you with 21H2. So it's right around the corner. Uh, and we really hope that you'll give it a shot and, you, and you'll love it. So uh, today we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to go through a recap of Network ATC. We're going to do a demo. We have a never before, before seen demo of uh, Windows Admin Center that Trung will take care of for us. Uh, we'll walk us through. And then we'll talk about some roadmap stuff. Uh, it's not actually just about Network ATC. So if you get bored with the first half, uh, and uh, despite Trung's demo being full of action, if you somehow, uh, got bored of me talking and, and dropped off the call, make sure you come back for the roadmap. We, we actually have some uh, a, a brand new thing that we are, have never talked about before publicly. We're going to show you at the end of the of the um, at the end of this uh, session here. Um, so with that, who am I? I'm Dan Kumo. I'm a program manager on the Azure Edge and Platform core networking team at Microsoft. I own the server network data plane, so that means that Anywhere your bits go, anywhere that the data is moving through the operating system or across the fabric, uh, those are going through my components or, or things that I am responsible for. Um, so whether it's on Azure, Windows, or HCI, it's kind of, it, it, you're using many, many, many of my features, including Network ATC, and I hope that doesn't upset you. <laughs> so uh, with me today is Trung Tran. Uh, Trung is one of the program managers on the Windows Admin Center team. So Trung and I are both in the same organization. Uh, Trung focuses on Windows Admin Center accessibility, uh, user engagements, and feedback. Um, and Trung is going to be taking us through a, a brand new network ATC demo in Windows Admin Center. So let's just quickly step back and make sure everybody's uh, heard of network ATC and what we're trying to solve for, right? With any time that you're deploying a hyper-converged infrastructure, there's a whole lot of things you have to do, right? And because of all those things you have to do, it takes a lot of time, right? It takes several hours, in fact, to actually deploy the system. And because there's so many things that you have to do, and it takes so much time, even if you script it out, um, it's complex, right? There's a lot of moving parts, and with that many moving parts, it becomes very error-prone, right? There, there's a lot of differentiation between the nodes. It's very difficult to get every every node in the cluster to leave, uh, excuse me, every node in the cluster to look exactly the same as every other node in the cluster, right? And then again, maybe you add multiple clusters, right? It gets, it compounds the problem, right? So we have a deployment time issue. We have a complexity issue. And ultimately, you know, anytime you change configuration, it's there's a chance that it's going to be error prone. And that ultimately really, uh, degrades the experience you're going to have on any hyperconverged infrastructure, let alone Azure Stack HCI. So what we've done is we've brought a new a new thing called Network ATC. And if you think about it, Network ATC is trying to tackle all of these things on the checklist here. As I mentioned, the reason it's so long in deployment, the reason it's so complex, the reason it's so error prone is because we have all of these things we have to take care of just for host networking. And of course, that's just host one, right? Once you get host one done, you actually have to make sure that the other nodes in the cluster, in cluster one, uh, look exactly the same. Otherwise, the reliability of your solution may degrade. Otherwise, uh, you know, the experience, the, the performance of your cluster may degrade. Um, it's just not great, right? You, it's not the way it's supposed to be. You know, I'm sure if I asked you to take a look at some of our performance uh, blogs out there, you'd see, you know, some really great numbers that we've demonstrated and shown, but then you try to repro that in your environment and, and you never quite get it right. Those are Microsoft numbers, I've been told, right? That they don't represent real world scenarios, right? Well, in part, that's because, well, you didn't configure it the same way that we did. And that's not necessarily your fault. We didn't make it overly easy for you to configure that. Well, now we are, right? So here, if you think about that, again, you go back to this network complexity. Uh, we've got four nodes here, right? It was hard enough just to get the one node uh, correct. Now we've got four nodes. That's very difficult to get exactly the same. Then if I go to the next slide, well, maybe I want to deploy more than one cluster, right? This just becomes a compounding issue. Um, now, many of you uh, will probably say, yeah, Dan, I don't need this. I have this all scripted. I've written my script years ago, and it's it's been refined. It's perfect. It's great. No problems. Um, well, unfortunately, you know, I, I work with 
world-class developers and they have bugs. I'm quite certain your script has a bug as well. I know my scripts have bugs, um, so that's not a slight on you. It's just, that's the nature of the beast, right? Um, so instead, there's, there's kind of a better way, and that's where network ATC comes in. Instead of deploying one node at a time, I deploy all nodes in the cluster, one time, one command. And I just give you, I just give you, uh, or, or you just tell us the intent of an adapter. So you can see on screen here, we have, uh, if I use my laser pointer here, I specify the NICs that I wanna use for a specific intent. And I specify the cluster name that this intent is going to apply to. And then I provide one or more intents. Now, it, I don't want you to uh, over index on this and, and think that this is the only deployment model you can. If you go out to our documentation, we have a whole bunch of uh, example deployments that you can do, that you can look through. Um, but the key here is that you provide one or more intents and the intent names are management, compute, or storage. If you give us those, we translate uh, the appropriate configuration and implement it on all the cluster nodes. We do more than that, actually. Um, as I mentioned, Network ATC is intent-based, right? So you give us that intent, we translate it, we deploy the Microsoft validated best practices uh, on each of the nodes. So it's not, again, it's not just that we do the deployment, but we de do the deployment the way that Microsoft would do it in our data center, the way that Microsoft is testing and validating it in our data center. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, we ensure uh, that one of the best features, one of the coolest features about Network ATC is that we actually uh, make sure that it auto remediates, right? So if any one of the nodes uh, drifts or gets out of compliance with the, the specified intent, Network ATC will bring that node back into compliance. I'm sure if I took a quick poll uh, and asked any of you, uh, have you ever gone to one of your systems and say, oh, how did that get there? How did that happen? How did, how did that configuration, how, why is that node different, right? Well, that's no longer a problem with Network ATC. Oops, sorry, my mouse is not clicking here. So uh, how do you actually get Network ATC? Well, if you're on 21H2, if you're on an Azure Stack HCI solu uh, solution, which is right now 21H2 is in preview, uh, you can install Windows Feature and just use Network ATC. Um, this does work cluster-wide. And as Chung is about to show us, it also now works with Windows Admin Center. So we're going to be releasing an update uh, to deploy either through Windows Admin Center in the deployment wizard, or as always, you can use PowerShell. And again, just to be clear, you this was about to GA, right? So as soon as 21H2 goes live, uh, this will be available to all subscribers, all Azure Stack HCI subscribers, not just the preview channel. Right now it is in preview. So if you're on the preview channel, please try it out. Give us some feedback. Um, but, you know, again, just to summarize here, you don't have to worry about turning every knob. You know, you don't have to worry about changing defaults between operating systems. You don't have to worry about the latest best practices or is my system supported? Did I deploy it in a supported manner? Do you, you don't have to worry about it changing over time. You have enough to worry about, right? You want to you wanna move on to things like SDN or AKS and HCI. You have enough to worry about. Let us take care of this for you. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Trung. Uh, Trung's gonna show us a, a pretty slick new demo, I think, of Windows, uh, Windows Admin Center deployment. Trung, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Trung Tran, and I am a program manager on the Windows Admin Center team. Before I showcase the new deployment workflow with Network ATC, I wanted to refresh you all with our existing wizard flow so you can see the improvements for yourself. Where users, um, then if you go to the next slide, where users were forced to have a management configuration, now the deployment wizard can deploy any configuration that network ATC can deploy. Windows Admin Center did not allow for converged solutions and creating and assigning an IP address were really easy to mess up and misconfigure. Um, I know what you see on the screen right now, stage 2.5, where you have to define the networks were one of the um, stages that were most blocking for a lot of you. Um, a couple errors uh, would be like, we couldn't configure and test network adapters, um, errors connecting to remote servers and things of that nature. Um, there would be times where like users would provide a static IP address in the same subnet for each adapter, but it would fail the ping test. And so 
um, based on our telemetry, we've seen that a lot of our users uh, sort of like abandon at this stage, and we hope to improve that somewhat. And so with that said, with the new ATC integration, we have simplified the user experience and made cluster deployment a lot easier. Right after stage one, you'll be prompted to either use the old flow or network ATC if your OS is 21H2. It's important to note that if you do not see this pop up, your hosts are not running 21H2, and so you need to upgrade beforehand. Um, and so in stage 2.1, uh, we automatically detect and verify your adapters and then auto populate them on screen if they are symmetrical adapters on all the nodes, which essentially means that each adapter has the same name, make, model, speed, and configuration. Uh, they should be named appropriately. And if an adapter is not symmetric with its counterparts on another host, or if there isn't an adapter named the same on another host, then it will not appear on this list of consolidated adapters. Uh, and if you notice that there is a missing adapter, you would click on that button there uh, to display all the adapters available and then configure them as you see fit uh, in this context panel here. Um, the reason why we added this context panel instead of like displaying it outrightly for all of you to use is because it's very um, j jarring to look at at first. If this was like the first stage that you looked at, um, we did our best to simplify the experience for you all and to make it more user friendly. Um, that's why we've abstracted a lot of it away. Um, and uh, Dan, is there anything else you'd like to add here? Uh, no, I think you did a great job. I would just add, I just maybe I would add actually, just that the the list that you see here is the consolidated list. So again, as Trung Trung stated, these are symmetric adapters that have the same name. Symmetric adapters defined in our documentation as the same make, model, speed, and configuration. The configuration part, network ATC is taken care of for you, right? So as long as they're the same make, model, and speed. And there's a corresponding adapter with the same name on every every node in the cluster. So you see there, there may be some here. We have Ethernet 2, NIC 1, NIC 1 on the left hand side. Those are already selected. If you find that something is missing, you can either rename it here um, or uh, try to figure out and resolve why it's not there. But now uh, what you can see is now these four, these uh, what is that five adapters we can move forward with through the wizard because ATC is, has stated that these are uh, ready to be used. Okay. Amazing, thank you, Dan. Uh, and then once the adapters are ready, you'll continue on to stage 2.2 to define your network intent. Uh, in this design, we've automatically uh, ensured that you are only able to select adapters that can be paired together to guarantee that the supported solution is deployed with the highest level of reliability and support. So um, as uh, Dan clicks through uh, this demo, um, you'll see that a lot of options, uh, such as the one you see right now, um, are grayed out because um, it says the message here is like only identical adapters can be grouped together. And so if they do not match, we do not allow you to choose it. Um, because you'll encounter an error down the road anyway. So we just grayed out that option for you. Um, just so that and it's this, less prone. It, it, oh. If I may, Trung, I'm sorry. It also yes. helps to make sure that you remain in a supported configuration, right? So we know that you can't team uh, asymmetric adapters, right? In this case, we have Intel adapters and Mellanox adapters. Well, we can't team those together. So we, the wizard won't allow you to do that. In fact, it just it kind of shows you that, hey, for these adapters that are, you're going to use for the same purpose, they need to be the same. They need to be symmetric. And rather than you having to worry about that, the WAC wizard uh, worries about that for you and takes make sure that you can't uh, select the wrong options. Yes. Um, and then finally, um, if you do wish to make any changes to the configuration, there is an option to customize your network settings. Um, available here. Um, and so from there, uh, ATC already provides a set list of defaults um, for all of these settings. But if you wish to deviate 
from those defaults within like um, the given boundaries, um, such as like the virtual switch settings, data center bridging settings, or the adapter properties, um, you can. Uh, Dan, is there anything you'd like to add here? Nope. Okay. No, please continue. Uh, yeah. All right. Um, and then uh, once that uh, you confirm that uh, this is uh, how you want to define your network intents, um, you will move on to the next stage, uh, 2.3. Uh, in stage 2.3, uh, this is where you will define the subnets and VLANs uh, for the storage intent adapters. Uh, you'll find the network ATC defaults are pre-configured in these boxes already for you at the very top. Um, if these defaults work for you, amazing. Um, if not, feel free to modify them um, within the given boundaries of network ATC. Um, and then, yes, there we go. And then uh, down below, you will have to define the IP addresses for each PNIC. Um, after the demo, Dan will talk about uh, Network ATC roadmap, uh, including one of the cool new features um, that will make this page even easier for you all. Um, uh, Dan, is there anything else you'd like to add here before I give a, a brief overview of stage three? Yeah, I think the, the key here is that Network ATC does not change what you deploy, just how you deploy it, right? So it's not going to change uh, you know, if you're going to modify your MTU between nodes, it's not going to change what VLANs you have to use. It's not going to force you down a specific path. Um, it's just going to make sure that what you do select is a supported option. And, uh, you know, we're going to provide the built in defaults, right? What Microsoft uses uh, in their labs. Yes. Um, and then uh, while <clears throat> I still have your attention, uh, in the cluster creation stage, um, we've seen that uh, there's been a lot of issues uh, due to like blocking errors uh, where people couldn't validate their clusters. So we reordered the steps to simplify the experience by allowing users to create the cluster in 3.1. And then with that, uh, they can deploy the networking information from stage two in 3.2. Uh, this allows us to implement and maintain the networking configuration across all the cluster nodes. Uh, and then finally, you'll be able to validate your clusters to ensure that all the nodes and intents defined uh, pass the validation successfully. And um, just uh, as a reminder, this feature will be available through an extension update at Ignite in November. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Trung. Yeah, so I think what you've seen here is we've taken a, even with the old workflow, um, you know, that workflow was still somewhat very complicated uh, because you still had to do a lot more work, right? You had to still provide all the same information, but you were just given a UI. And that UI certainly helped you work through that information, right? It kind of gave you a little bit more of a guided experience, but you still had to think about all the little details about the configuration. Now with this uh, update to the Windows Admin Center deployment UI, uh, we have a significantly better uh, streamlined experience where you have to worry about only the things that you really need to worry about. Um, you know, for example, what VLANs are used on the physical network. Um, so just to kind of close that out, we're, we'll talk about the roadmap for network ATC before we go on to our the uh, big new thing that we're going to talk about here. Um, you know, just a couple of updates. Trung alluded to um, some improvements in Network ATC that will make this page even easier. So as, as simplified as this is, right? In the old page, we had to specify an IP address, a subnet mask, a VLAN for every single adapter that was being used in the storage network. Well, now uh, in, in the future, in a future update to Network ATC, we're going to actually provide the auto configuration of IPs for any storage adapters. Right, so anytime that you specify the storage intent, any physical adapter included in that storage intent will automatically find an IP address in the subnet and VLAN uh, or in a default subnet and VLAN that Network ATC assumes. Now, again, you're not going to be forced down that path. Uh, this UI will allow you to disable that behavior and you can specify your own IPs if that's your choice. Uh, however, you know, many of our customers 
don't actually care, right? They just want it configured. And so as long as the VLAN is available on the physical network, or sometimes they're using a switchless configuration, um, you know, network ATC can go off and actually find all, all these IP addresses and save these questions for you, right? Um, one additional thing is that uh, currently network ATC under the hood um, does not check uh, cluster-wide adapter symmetry, right? So it assumes that as long as the adapters uh, can be teamed, um, you know, that it would be uh, fine to do so. Um, in the future, we will provide additional support capabilities to identify on the local node if the adapters are teamable and across nodes, right? So we'll ensure that if you're using a 40 gig adapter on node one, that you have a 40 gig adapter on node two. And if it's 100 gig on node three, well, we'll flag that, right? Uh, so those are some uh, great new little additions to the solution. Again, all of this driving towards making your Azure Stack HCI solution uh, completely stable and reliable and making sure that you have the a best possible experience with your line of business apps that are sitting on top of our Azure Stack HCI solution. So with that, we're going to talk about one more great new feature uh, that I'm really excited about. It's called Network HUD. Um, and this is really about finding uh, or identifying operational problems in your environment. So after Network ATC has deployed your environment, how do you know that it's actually working, right? Network ATC configures the host, but you might have a physical network that's sitting in between and actually stopping your connectivity between nodes. How do you know that? It becomes very challenging to tell. And it's all specific to your environment, right? So, and we started out with this picture again, deployment time, complexity, error prone. Uh, these are things that network ATC addresses here, right? Uh, but the operational analytics is something that network ATC doesn't address. Network HUD is going to address these things. And what that really means is that we're going to ingest Network HUD is a, a, a service that will ingest uh, data from a variety of different sources. And if you look at you know, the physical switch and event logs and performance counters and functional tests, well, now we have another large problem, right? You have to be an expert at knowing how to ingest and define uh, uh, you know, the, the problems, right? When you see a problem or when you see a crash or a, a, an error on your system, how do you draw the answer out from the vast amount of data that's being provided to you? Well, you know, we put our heads together here at Microsoft and we, we have our own lab that run into these very same problems. And so we take in that data and we perform a real-time analysis, right? The real-time analysis might be, in a simple example, if you can think about a NIC that might be flapping, right? It might be disconnecting and reconnecting, disconnecting, reconnecting. If that event occurs, X number of times within Y minutes, we can form a conclusion, right? We can perform a real-time analysis and perform a conclusion. Of course, in the future, that's why it says HUD update there, we'll also be able to establish trends for your environment, right? We'll be able to identify traffic that is, uh, you know, expected to occur and make sure that your VMs on your work on your systems actually can achieve that traffic. Um, finally, we're going to give you contextual responses, right? Where possible, we'll auto-remediate, and where, where possible really means where safe, right? So if we have enough adapters in that same flapping NIC example, um, we could remove an unstable adapter or quarantine it. Uh, but if it's not safe to do, do so, we'll just auto-alert, right? So we'll, we'll uh, proactively provide uh, contextual responses. If there's missing VLANs and things like that, we can tell you what VLANs are not being seen. So again, detect, assess, remediate. So here's some of the operational issues we'll, we'll tackle. So if you look at the fabric misconfiguration, maybe we're missing a VLAN on the fabric. Um, maybe we're missing a VLAN being advertised to one team member. Actually, I had an issue come into my inbox this morning with that very issue, right? One team member uh, had a VLAN available to it on the physical network and one team member did not. That was all on the same node, right? So when the a, a VM, let's say you have two VMs, they each use the same uh, different network adapters there. They might have different connectivity because the VLANs aren't available on the fabric. Um, VLANs advertisement across team members and the nodes, right? So if the nodes, if the nodes themselves don't have the same VLANs advertised, if the MTU uh, that you've specified in your network ATC configuration can't get across the fabric, we can tell you that. Um, 
if you have incorrect data center bridging PFC or ETS, right? So if you have incorrect data center bridging configuration on the locally connected switch ports, we'll be able to tell you that. Um, of course, some operational states like TCP, UDP, RDMA, uh, we have many scenarios where uh, our customers are running their solution. Uh, they think it's using RDMA, but it's not, right? It's actually consuming the CPU cycles that your VMs need on your host, right? Maybe it's only actually doing that on one host. How do you know that? How do you see that? Network HUD will help you there. Uh, state changes, again, as we mentioned, disconnects or resets of the adapter, consistent uh, disconnections or resets. We can identify that, quarantine the adapter if needed. Um, PCIe bandwidth limitations, this is a really interesting one. Uh, now that we're getting into higher speed adapters, you know, 100 gig is becoming a, a norm in many of your environments. The PCIe bandwidth, uh, uh, the, the slot that it's plugged into may not be fast enough to actually allow you to achieve that 100 gigabits, right? Uh, so we can identify those things. Again, topology uh, mapping, some of the, the physical and lo logical topology efficiencies, we can make recommendations there. Um, whether or not your cabling is helping you there actually achieve the, the line rate of the adapters. And of course, hotspot identification. We mentioned before with the HUD update, we'll be able to identify uh, latency and throughput hotspots uh, to help you resolve physical issues on your network. So again, just to summarize here, some of the goals of Network ATC is to identify operational networking issues, right? We're not gonna tackle host configuration issues. That's Network ATC's job. Um, environmental awareness. We wanna make sure uh, that we are understanding the data that's coming in in your environment. It's critical that we, we operate this solution for your environment because your environment is going to be different than others. We love to auto remediate whenever possible, but we also don't want to put you into a, a, a worse uh, si uh, situation. So we'll only do that when it's safe. Uh, otherwise, we will always alert. So we will alert and if possible, automatically remediate. And then of course, as a result of this, right, the platform stability just goes up. So storage basis direct, AKS, HCI, SDN, anything that sits on top of the platform just inherently gets better. Uh, this is integrated with Network ATC. So the only way that you that Network HUD will actually track the adapters is if you're using Network ATC and the adapter is included in one of one or more, one of the intents that you have specified with Network ATC. It does integrate with the existing health and monitoring solution. So there's nothing else you need to do there. If you're using Azure Monitor, you're using uh, any of the uh, health and monitoring capabilities already in the platform that will be that will naturally uh, integrate. And again, diagnostics as a service, we don't have to just wait for a brand new OS. If we find an emerging issue in the ecosystem, um, you know, based on our support information or telemetry, we can provide you a new service, uh, a new solution, excuse me, and you can just update that automatically in your environment when you're ready. Now, how do I get it, right? Uh, the first thing is you do need to use an Azure Stack HCI compliant network switch. You may be uh, aware that we have some public documentation outlining some switches that have met all the requirements that we've asked them to do to, to uh, implement. Uh, those switches are the ones that will be able to leverage this capability because they provide the information that we need uh, to us. If they're not on that list, I, there's no guarantee that we'll be able to actually provide any of these cool new details. Um, of course, stay tuned to the preview channel. This will first appear there. Uh, in, a in a future preview release. Uh, it is not coming, Network HUD is not coming in 21H2. It will be coming in a release after that. Um, and it will be automatically available at that point. So there's no additional cost for this, uh, nothing like that. You know, it's, it's going to be automatically available to all the HCI subscribers. All right, so with that, um, oh, and also I'll just note, if you're uh, looking for the link to our compliant network switches, um, that'll be in the slides that I think uh, Karsten and, um, and uh, Manfred will send out. So uh, please look for that. All right, on to questions. Or is everybody asleep? <laughs> I don't know, not everybody is asleep. Uh, you, you finished a little bit early, uh, so half an hour. Uh, so we have a lot of room for questions and uh, you open, open that can of worms, right? Oh, uh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Because you are responsible for everything network in uh, Azure Stack HCI and Windows Server. So uh, 
Um, jokes no aside, um, <laughs> the hot feature is, is coming in a feature release. I, I like that what I see. I have actually a question about um, about ATC. Um, okay. What about uh, in a stretch cluster? We will have replication networks. Can you configure that also with ATC or uh, is it uh, is it only for the easy stuff? <laughs> Uh, no, it's not only for the easy stuff. I will say there are some uh, caveats with stretch clustering, which is that right now on the host storage network, so if you think about the underlying storage network, um, we need to make sure that the VLANs are actually the exact same on both sites. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, they can be, you know, like we showed in the demo, it could be 711, 712, 713. We need to use that same uh, set of VLAN. That doesn't mean you have to stretch a VLAN, just to be clear, right? For the uh, underlay networks here, that can be, uh, you know, the same VLANs, but in different data centers or different locations, so they don't have to be stretched, okay? Um, but you would just need to use the same VLANs on both sites. That's the only limitation right now. We do aim to solve that in the future, uh, but that is the only limitation that I'm aware of with stretch. Yeah. Um... To give you some input there, uh, I work with a lot of network guys, you know that, and if they have a different subnet, it's nearly always a different VLAN. So uh, if we have that in two date, in two sites, uh, I really can't convince them to use the same VLANs. But uh, we have a question from Dave. He want to ask that live, so he joined us now. And I have also Sorry, another question before we go on, can I, Before we go on, let me just uh, go back to your last question, which or last statement, which, you know, so again, it totally depends on your design with stretch cluster, right? If you're in yeah. the same data center, that subnet and VLAN can be exactly the same, right? If you're using stretch in the same data center, it can be the exact same subnet and VLAN. If it's going across a site, right, across a geographical distance of some sort, um, then yeah, that might be a little bit more difficult. I, I've still seen customers do that. Uh, however, I, I recognize that it is a little bit uh, more difficult. In the future release, we are looking to address that. Okay, cool. So Dave. Yeah, Dan, I've got a quick question for you just in regards to the switch vendor support. Um, I do a lot of work with uh, Mellanox and work with their SN2100 platform. Um, since being bought by NVIDIA, they've actually deprecated some of their um, 40 gig switches. And like you said, 100 gigs or uh, it's either 100 or 25 is really what, what your choices are now. Um, so in that platform and in your testing, um, are you guys using Mellanox and is it like CX5, CX6s? What's, what do you have? And then the last part of that question is with the, the, the HUD configuration, is there going to be switch side configuration changes and will you publish those changes somewhere for us to configure the switches properly so we can use it? Yeah, so let's let's take the first one first, which is what do we use in our lab? And uh, I'm not going to make an advertisement for any specific vendors. We do use physical switches. We also have switchless configurations in our environment to kind of test the gamut. Um, what I would say is that currently NVIDIA and Mellanox is not on our compliant list. We hope that they will join shortly. Um, regardless of the vendor that is, you know, whether they're on the list or not, we would wholeheartedly encourage you to reach out to them and say, you know, look, you're not on the list and my switch needs to be there. Why is it not there? Right. Ask them. Uh, you know, we all work on feedback from our customers. Right. So if you tell us that this is important to you, we will absolutely listen. And I'm I'm quite certain that Mellanox and NVIDIA would as well. Um, you know, re again, regard regardless, there are many switches that are not on that list today. So, again, that goes for all of you. Please, please reach out to all of your network suppliers and find out why they're not, right? We, I know that many of them are working on it, uh, but there are some requirements that we have added that uh, many of them could not quite yet uh, obtain. So again, they are working on it, but uh, you know, it's gonna take a little while. So, do you, so the only I, way to speed have, up is if you keep asking. <laughs> sorry, okay. do, you have, do you have a published list of uh, the switches that are compliant right now? Yes, and the, the link is actually in our, um, is actually in the slide deck, but it's also, if okay. you look up the physical uh, physical network requirements, we have two main documentation pages uh, for quote unquote data plane, the server network data plane, if you will. Um, there's one that's called physical host network requirements and uh, sorry, physical network requirements and host network requirements. There are two different mm -hmm. pages. They talk about things like stretch clustering. They talk about, um, you know, the physical switches, RDMA, that type of stuff. So that list of switches is actually on there. 
will continue to add more. So as soon as they they come, uh, you know, we we have communicated with them and we've validated or verified that they have met all the requirements, we'll publish them right on the list there, um, along with any of the requirements, right? So I think we just had Juniper that joined our list, um, and there is a minimum firmware version that you have to have on the switch, right? Um, now again, these requirements aren't terribly complex, right? So it's not adding a significant uh, chunk of code uh, into your configuration here. Really, the only thing that you're already that you're not already doing is enabling the LODP uh, information that we'll use. LODP is called Link Layer Discovery Protocol. And it's just a protocol that uh, allows the uh, communication of configuration between neighbors. In this case, the neighbor being Azure Stack HCI hosts with the switch. Uh, so the switch can send us that information and we can, uh, you know, just use it from there. Um, so, one more quick question for you, just in regards to where it's going from a roadmap perspective. Sorry, Karsten. Um, is is the overall goal of this to start looking at being able to auto provision the switches so that we can basically just have a plug and play type infrastructure so that we're not having two planes that we have to work down, be able to drive all of that from a single configuration UI? Uh, so it's a great question. Um, I, while I would love to get there, that is going to take time. So I have no immediate plans to do that right now. Um, but yeah, we'd love to hear more about that offline. Thanks, Dave. Now I jump in. Uh, I have two questions from the audience I want to ask, but before that I want to clarify on LLDP because in, in a lot of scenarios, people like to have LLDP uh, enabled on the servers so they can see them in the switches. Uh, the, what is on the other end? Is it possible to configure LLDP on a Windows server and Azure Stack HCI? Because I didn't find the commands for that. Ah, well, they're Maybe not I'm installed by default. Such, yeah, yeah, they're, they're not installed by default, actually. But yes, it is possible. Uh, if you install the RSAT tools for the data center bridging uh, configuration, the yeah. uh, LODP command lets come along with that. Uh, so okay. you'll see like enable LODP agent and um, things like that. Uh, we are improving those as well. Uh, along with this update with Network HUD, we'll be improving those capabilities that come in box. Um, LODP is uh, one of those things that was built a long time ago uh, for voice over IP. It's a very interesting uh, backstory. We won't bore anybody with that, that uh, <laughs> uh, background right now, but uh, they are in box. They are available today. Uh, we've even made some helpers. Uh, if you go, there's a blog on our uh, site called Troubleshooting Switch Misconfigurations. If you go to that, there's a, a PowerShell module, an additional PowerShell module that you can download from the PowerShell gallery. Um, it can, you can use it to enable the LODP agent across uh, a list of NICs or all the NICs that are in a specific team. Um, you can then test and make sure that you know you've actually seen data come in from the switch and then you can also get that information and see what that information is it automatically kind of parses it for you um, so yeah so it is available uh, both inbox capabilities but then also a helper externally and we hope to bring all of that inbox in the future okay cool and i understand it's also available in windows server because the data center bridging module module is also in windows server right it's not only yeah, so the HAI, oh? No, no, the, you're correct. The uh, data center bridging module, as well as the PowerShell module that I mentioned before, will work on either Windows Server or Azure Stack HCI. Uh, Network HUD is going to do all of this okay. automatically for you, and that will only be available on Azure Stack HCI. So there is some value, uh, some certainly some benefits that are there. Um, you could do all this manually. You could, uh, I'm sure, write your own service to actually uh, you know, rerun all these commands and do all the crazy things that we're doing under the hood for you. Um, We'd recommend you just let leave us to it and and uh, join us on Azure Stack HCI. Okay, so uh, I will send you also a mail offline because I'm I'm keen to have another webinar with you about networking in all the stuff. Is if you are up to it, but we can discuss it uh, offline. So I have two questions from the audience. One is from Great. Chris. Can you save the network ATC configuration from WAC as a PowerShell script just before you sub submit it for applying changes to use in case you rebuild the cluster? Great question. Great question. So uh, I have I have good news and I have great news, right? So, <laughs> so network ATC first uses the cluster database 
uh, as its database, right? So when you configure, when you say add net intent or set net intent, that goal state is actually stored in the cluster database itself, right? So from there, all you really need to do is back up the cluster database like you already probably are, right? Uh, the other thing is, the, the other aspect of what you're uh, kind of hit, uh, hinting at is, what if I have another cluster, right? How do I get that one to look exactly like the first one? Well, we have an inbox command like called copy net intent. So once you create your net intent and maybe you add in a whole bunch of overrides and customizations, right? You really didn't like our defaults, that's fine. Um, instead of having to replay all of those on the next cluster, you can just take the first cluster, say copy net intent from cluster A to cluster B and from cluster A to cluster C, et cetera, et cetera, right? So Network ATC makes that actually very easy. You kind of have inside the cluster database, just to recap, you have a full on backup of that configuration. Everything that Network ATC is using as its information store is in the cluster database. You can actually look at it. I do not modify it that way. That's <laughs> not supported, uh, but you can certainly look at it uh, and back it up with your regular cluster backups. Cool. Very Great cool. question. I know Another question from the audience. Uh, will network ATC be coming in uh, system center virtual machine manager also? Uh, maybe that is. Support. So that's unknown at this time. Um, I would love to see it. Uh, we still have a lot of things to figure out. There's a lot of uh, additional pieces that we need to work on uh, in order to make that possible. OK, thanks so much. So if other MVPs have questions for Dan, I know he, some are online. Uh, it's now your time. Uh, otherwise, um, do we have more questions? Yeah, we have one in the chat. Do you see it when you scroll down, Karsten? OK, maybe. Uh, let me scroll yeah. down. Will there, I think uh, Dan talked already about a Mellanox support, but uh, to clarify, will there be a Mellanox support with Mellanox slash Onyx OS instead of Cumulus OS switches? I think you said oh. there is no Mellanox support at all at, in the moment. So uh, just to make sure I understood the question, is the question about the Onyx OS versus the Cumulus OS? Yeah, the, uh, that the, the it is asked if if there will be support for the Onyx OS and, uh, and okay. not the Cumulus. Yeah, so I, I think what I would recommend is that the if you are running a Mellanox switch, you reach out to Mellanox and find out their roadmap. Um, not sure that I have the all of the information on on their exist on their future roadmap and their guidelines there. Um, but I would recommend that you reach out to Nvidia. Uh, I, sorry that I'm using Nvidia and Mellanox interchangeably here. Uh, but yeah. I would recommend that you reach out to NVIDIA there um, and just get their sense, uh, get get the information directly from them. Yeah, I think the the question was about uh, the customer has maybe the Onyx OS like I have in my man, in my NVIDIA switches and now Mellanox is, uh, uh, NVIDIA is all about uh, Cumulus Linux. So this is a, mm -hmm. a new way to go. So uh, I think the, the question was more about if you would ever support it, you said you don't know yet because NVIDIA has to tell yeah, you which one would yeah, be. Uh, yeah. yeah, sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you off there, Carson. I, I was just going to say that uh, ultimately the OS is uh, owned by NVIDIA there, right? So the, the switches OS is actually owned by NVIDIA, which is why, uh, you know, we need compliant network switches, meaning, you know, we, we can't build the software for the switch. Um, so it's only for switches that actually support the capabilities that we've published. And again, you can go and look on this uh, online. You can go to our public documentation. We list all the requirements that we've sent to the switch vendors are actually public. You can look at them yourself and you can ask them, right? Like, you know, question one, question two, question three, which one of these don't you support and why? And when will you support it, right? And I will say that uh, most of them are working on it right now. Okay. So if we have no more questions for Dan and uh, Drung, uh, Dave has one more, I see, Dave. And I have one question. And Manfred. Yeah, oh, first uh, Dave and then Manfred. First Dave and then Manfred. Yeah, Dave. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> first Dave. Okay. Okay. So, so, so with with lack of support for my Mellanox gear, um, how does this how does that pan out in an iWarp configuration? Then is that an easier configuration for us? Because you really don't care so much about the switches at that point in time, because you're driving everything inside of the OS, right? So, is is this a bigger push to go iWarp over Rocky V2? No, I wouldn't say that. I, I would say that these two things are unrelated. We'll work, you know, Network HUD will work just as well with 
iWarp or Rocky. And and again, I, I don't want to make this uh, about NVIDIA specifically or any other specific vendor. Um, you know, all the vendors are working on this that I'm aware of, right? We've talked to many different vendors, whether they're on the list or not currently. Um, you know, that's how Juniper got on the list, right? We talk, we were talking with Juniper. Uh, they came up with, uh, you know, the feature gaps that they had. They closed the feature gaps and they released that in an updated uh, uh, firmware release. So again, this isn't uh, specific to iWarp or Rocky, nothing like that. Um, you know, it, it's at least not to say that, uh, that this makes it easier to do one or the other. In fact, we're trying to make all of uh, all deployments easier, right? So that's kind of the goal of Network HUD is to highlight what you, you know, how you are configured and if it's operationally working, right? The two Network ATC and Network HUD work together. Okay, um, uh, over I have answer. absolutely not technical question um, then. <laughs> uh, we always use this acronyms ATC um, uh, and now <laughs> Network Hat. Can you say what it stands for? What's the official full name for ATC? I researched in docs and in docs uh, it starts with uh, this is Network <laughs> ATC and there's no <laughs> full name for it. Uh, so Network ATC is the full name for it. Uh, there's no acronym okay. there. We had an acronym uh, internally just as we were talking about a conceptual uh, name, but we have not gone forward with that, right? The the proper name is Network ATC. So where you see things on my slides that just say ATC, that was a mistake where I should have said Network ATC, right? The proper name is Network ATC. Network HUD, uh, the HUD does sp stand for heads up display, right? So the idea conceptually you can think of a heads up display, right? You get a, um, you know, if you if you want to think about a, a, a pilot in a plane, right? They get all this little uh, data coming into them on their screen and they have to somehow make sense of that, right? Um, and so Network HUD stands for heads up display where we're taking that information, we're coalescing it down to just what you need and we're providing some actionable data for you uh, that you can, uh, that you can, make a determination as to whether or not your system is actually working right again instead instead of seeing all those performance counters instead of seeing all the event logs instead of seeing uh ldp information and you having a way to like oh it said this is trunked or subtype seven is not you know configured properly right instead of you having to worry about all that network hud will do that for you so it, again it's coalescing all the many endpoints of data uh into some actionable tangible information that you can use and so that that was the idea behind Network HUD heads up display. Again, it is a proper name, so we won't refer to it as heads up display or anything like that. It'll be Network HUD. Um, okay. We have another question from the audience. Um, uh, is the Microsoft Zonic, Zonic Switch OS supported? I didn't even I didn't know that Microsoft has a Switch OS. Yes. So uh, Sonic Sonic is uh, not something that I work on directly. Uh, I am very much aware of it, right? So Microsoft has an OS, uh, a Switch OS. If you're if you're really interested in the background and the research on this, you can look up Switch Abstraction Interface, uh, SAI. Uh, this was uh, kind of a I, I don't I I probably will do a disservice by my definition, but this was kind of its uh, first of its kind where we abstracted Microsoft, not me, uh, abstracted the uh, firmware OS that is running on the switch from the underlying hardware that's there. And so Sonic has the ability to actually run uh, across any uh, switch. And you know, Dave mentioned before the NVIDIA switch, right, which could run Onyx or Cumulus, same concept that's based off of SAI, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, the, the same, same concept is there, right? You can kind of take the Sonic OS and put it on various different hardware. Uh, to the specific question of whether it's supported, so, uh, we do microsoft does not support sonic publicly uh, it is used for internal use but just like our you know we have various different uh, open source components that we provide to the community uh, there are various vendors that have actually forked that code um, and are shipping uh you know publicly public versions right i think dell has one that actually ships a sonic os publicly uh, we have not had anyone uh, that is running that sonic os reach out uh, about compliance so I can't state whether or not it actually is uh, one of the compliant OSs. Um, interestingly, that's actually brings up another issue, right? Because you might have compliant hardware, but not uh, software. Um, and so where possible, we will try to make, you know, put a, a combined uh, list together um, if it's not uh, if it's not immediately apparent, right? We'll try to note both the firmware OS and uh, and the switch line. 
Yeah, Dan, and I, I think I have bad news for you because in the moment you have three switch vendors on your list. Uh, I think it's <laughs> Dell, Lenovo and Juniper. Yep. Um, if I'm correct, and Udo is also in the chat from, from Lenovo, I think Lenovo doesn't have these switches anymore. So <laughs> That's right. So, well, so, but if I remove it from I the list. I have those switches, they are great, but uh, they don't make them anymore. So, unfortunately. Yeah, so if I remove it from the list, though, I'll, everybody would uh, suddenly be super worried that it's not on the list and say, well, my switch isn't compliant, it won't work, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm kind of caught between a rock and a hard place there. But what I would say is that, yes, we are, we are aware. Lenovo told us right when we, when we were talking okay. with them that uh, these devices were end of life. Uh, but we didn't want to exclude them, right? If you had already purchased that switch, um, you know, it makes sense to continue on um, and, and just continue using that switch. You're not going to have a degraded experience with Network HUD. Um, you know, it's, it is what it is, right? You can't buy it from Lenovo anyway, so it's it's not an informed uh, purchasing problem, right? So, yeah. uh, but that is one of the benefits of having a compliant list is that when you go to purchase a switch, you purchase it knowing whether or not it will be able to do these things that we have uh, been trying to do. And so, um, if it is on the list, great. It will you'll have no no problems whatsoever. We fully expect it to to. Uh, uh, to integrate just fine with with Network HUD and, and any future capabilities we provide. Um, I will say that it's going to be version specific too, right? So there's this kind of a two part uh, a two part relationship, right? So Microsoft is building new capabilities like Network HUD to leverage these capabilities that are built by the the uh, the vendor, uh, the switch vendor. And so with 21H2, right, there are certain requirements in a future OS we may increase those requirements, right? And your network switch vendor will need to add those new capabilities to be on that same list, right? Mm -hmm. If they're not, uh, then you'll just, again, the the experience will degrade a little bit, right? You'll probably be warned or see an error in your log that says, whoop, we didn't find this information we were looking for. Um, so we can't check for this. See, if I don't error uh, and tell you that, I'm, that I didn't get the information from the switch, you'll go along thinking, oh, HUD's happy. Right, and that I don't want you to think that either. Right, so HUD didn't find any errors. Well, it's because I didn't it didn't actually check anything. Right, so we will alert you if the information didn't come in uh, to Network HUD, and and so you can follow up to the vendor at that point. That's great. So I have two more questions for you. Uh, one is uh, from Jaromir. Jaromir unfortunately can't ask him uh, ask the questions himself because he's having dinner with his kids and that would be too loud. So he's asking, and I know where, where this is coming from, uh, if the network ATC database uh, will expand for other cluster settings, so I could just export configuration and load it in, uh, into one node, and, and then it would deploy cluster, including all settings. You know, he is automating a lot with uh, MS Lab, mm. so I think this is, uh, this is why, why he asked this question. Yeah, so I'll take that as a two-part question, actually. Um, and it's, I'm just going to point out, Carson, it's a good thing I ended early because we got a lot of questions here, right? So this is good. I had a feeling. Yeah, uh, yeah so the I'll take that as a two-part question. The first is, uh, I'll take it in reverse order, actually. Can I run this in a virtual machine? Network ATC will absolutely deploy in a virtual machine, but you will see a status of failed for any intent, for uh, some of the intents, at least uh, the storage intent. And the reason is, uh, not because it actually failed to do what it's doing, but it couldn't deploy things like data center bridging inside the virtual machine. Those capabilities don't exist. And so whereas you might just be able to use ATC to deploy inside of a virtual machine, um, if you're going off some logic to like check when it's completed, you might find that you're you're going to run into a problem there. Um, I don't know if there's any other deviations, um, so don't quote me on that, but uh, you know, for any of the other different types of intents. Um, but what I would say to the first question of whether or not we will take on more uh, cluster network settings, uh, we can absolutely do that. Uh, the, you know, it kind of comes up to um, a question of what settings do you want to see. So I'd like to I'd like to actually follow up and tell us uh, what don't we do today that you would like to see us do, right? Things like the auto IP uh, that we're bringing in a future release uh, in the you know in the next release with uh, Azure Stack HCI. Um, that was direct customer feedback, right? That was direct customer feedback where we said, well, there's no real way we can predict IP addresses, right? And then they said, yeah, but couldn't you try, right? We said, all right, well, you know, we'll come up with an idea, right? And we came up with an idea and, and a way to allow you to override that if you don't like our idea, right? Um, and that's kind of how that was born. So by all means, tell us your feedback, give us your feedback. 
Um, the worst thing we can say is not right now, right? We can't get to it right now, but we'll, we'd be happy to take that um, and put it through our planning process and see if we can get it in. Okay, I, I see Jaromir is typing. Uh, I fear he's typing <laughs> long, so I do first my question and if Sorry, there is enough go. time left, <laughs> Jaromir, otherwise Jaromir has to send it offline. I'm pretty <laughs> sure he knows your mail address. Um, so in uh, Azure Stack HCI uh, 21H2, um, there is an improvement for RDMA. It's called uh, that encryption, for example, or um, is it encryption? Yeah, encryption. There's a better support for encryption with RDMA. And nowadays we have the problem if you use encryption, it's going through the CPU and RDMA is going um, not through the CPU. The, the card is directly get, uh, patching the data from the RAM. So is uh, can you explain, is there an improvement or is it more marketing? And if there is improvement, <laughs> how you do it? <laughs> Uh, so I will I will say that this is an area I'm unfamiliar with. I'm not I'm not uh, familiar with all the intricacies there. I I would like to say that it's not marketing. So I'll point you to Cosmos and Jason Yi. Uh, Cosmos yeah. and Jason Yi would be the most knowledgeable on that. Okay. So, but uh, but I got that right. They they said uh, there is an improvement in RDMA for encryption. Yeah, huh? I also heard this. Yeah. And you are responsible for RDMA, so I'm shocked that you don't know about it. Not so I'm not I'm responsible for. <laughs> So, so this is a layering problem, Carson. This is what we call a layering pro problem, right? I'm, I am responsible for RDMA and the physical NIC and the data plane. Uh, yeah. SMB is an application, and the encryption of right. SMB is also part of that application. And so, I'm not responsible. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. But okay. Yeah. Was, there you go. That's how I you. see how I skirted yeah. out of that one. There you go. <laughs> Very good. So now, uh, Jaromir. Uh, specified his question many things oh that's great many things smb bandwidth limits cluster network settings rdma settings encryption signing cluster cache so he wants all these things and and there is more all cpu mitigation well, so, okay so As, let's hang on let's uh <laughs> let's let's take a quick so network etc is about networking right so uh cluster cache is not necessarily networking but again all of that information is likely stored in the cluster database as well um, I would certainly recommend that you follow up with the non-networking uh, uh, PMs about some of these non-networking things. And, and if there's a way that you want to improve, uh, I would certainly recommend that. Now, to your specific networking, some of these are networking things, right? Cluster yeah. network settings, great point, right? So we could certainly take a look at those. Uh, the RDMA settings, I'm not, again, you know, we, we get into this layering conversation of SMB, right? SMB being a consumer of RDMA. Um, and I don't want to go too far into all that, right? But the long and the short of it is there are certain, you know, uh, there's a platform capability called RDMA, and then there are people that use RDMA. Um, in this case, SMB is one of those things that uses RDMA. So yes, we could certainly do more there um, and, and integrate further. Um, again, we just need keep pinging us PMs about uh, what we you'd like to see, um, preferably offline and like an email that, you know, I, I'm not going to find this uh, chat list again, but uh, please send to me an email, Jaromir. Uh, yes, and I'm pretty sure you will get an email from Jaromir. I'm, 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 I'm confident I will. <laughs> <laughs> so we have now one minute to the next session. I want to thank uh, you, Dan, and also Trung for the great presentation. And we have a lot of questions here. First, the audience was shy, but then more and more questions came in. <laughs> and networking is always a part of uh, clustering that is very, very important. And if it's not working, nothing is working. So that, thanks, Dan.